Great. Okay. Let's go ahead and begin a word of prayer and we will begin our study. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you tonight, we just want to give you all the glory and the praise and we thank you for the protection and the safety and the peace that we have tonight in Tacloban. We thank you for the peace right now in the Philippines. Father God, we ask forgiveness of our sins and we know that we fall short of your glory every day, that we fail your law, we break your law. By the grace of, of your son, through your son, we have a continued right relationship with you, Father. So I ask that you, we would not take advantage of, of your grace, that we would endeavor every day to grow closer and closer to you, that we would put to death our flesh, and that we would live by the Spirit, Father God. Father, as we study this prayer of confession in Psalm 51, may we be more accurate in our prayer uh, of confessing our sins to you. May we acknowledge what we've done. May we also clearly confess our sins and, and also ask for forgiveness from you. And I pray that you would just guide and direct. I ask for a blessing upon each one here who's attending, bless their businesses, bless their practices. And also, Father God, I just ask that you would protect and bless their families. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, so we are continuing in our study. And uh, what I want to do is I, I just want to go ahead and let's just quickly, I have a quick introduction for the, with the PowerPoint, and then we'll go into the text. And uh, today is going to be deep. <laughs> and uh, I was doing a lot of study, and I'm excited about what we will learn. And this, this prayer is so, so profound. And I've never studied this prayer in depth before. I'm only on like verse five or verse up to verse seven, I think almost verse seven. And it's just so, so profound. So let's go ahead. I just want to quickly introduce us to what we'll be doing tonight. It's this uh, session two on our study in, in the uh, prayer of confession. And so just quick overview. I do want to read the Psalm again. Uh, I think that each one of us, both uh, in our private time and also in church, the more we're commanded to read the scripture. So I really want to just read the, the word of God again to us and for us to think about it. Uh, next, we, we'll just discuss the questions and observations that you had prepared for tonight. And um, we'll, we'll add to our list and hopefully we'll, answer, we'll be able to answer some questions and then maybe we'll have some more questions. And then uh, next we'll do is, my goal is to study Psalm 51, 1 to 7, but that might not be. Um, we'll see what happens here. And then uh, assignment for next week, three observations and three questions for Psalm 51, 6 to 10. Okay, so again, I'm looking for good observations, three, three questions concerning Psalm 51, 6 to 10. And um, uh, that's not so much, but... I'm looking, I'm looking for you to really to interact with the text and to really uh, use your magnifying glass and also some resources, okay? And then just some highlights for tonight, some of the highlights for our plan. Compare Saul's confession to David's confessions. <laughs> so right now we're, we are studying David's confession, okay? And there's a lot of information here. However, when you compare David's confession to Saul's confession... <laughs> Oh, wow. What I want us to see is you can clearly see a difference between a contrite spirit, a humble spirit, a spirit that is really sees his sin and wants to be right with God, and then someone who really is not acknowledging what he's done. So anyway, let's, I, won't, I won't go into there further, but it's really interesting comparing the two, putting them side by side. Uh, I also want to, so we're going to really explore what, what it means to truly confess, true confession. And again, I mentioned this last week, but it's so important in our churches, especially those caught in a sin, okay? We need to, we need to work through the process with them. We need to work to, to, to reconcile and restore them. But at the same time, there must be a true uh, turning, a true confession, because if there is not, you're not actually dealing with their sin, and then there their 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 sin will continue and it will become worse okay so it's really important that we plot, we identify sin their sin is confessed and then there's a full reconciliation right now we're focusing on what does true confession look like 
because once you see really what you when you see what true confession is like you know when you don't see it <laughs> okay that's really important when you see david's confession and you really compare it to saul's and just look at what is going on there you can clearly see someone who is truly broken over their sin and someone who who is being forced to confess but doesn't really believe they've done anything wrong. And they're just kind of like, okay, I have to do this to restore a relationship, but I don't really mean it, okay? So I want us to see that, all right? Um, especially within our churches. And then lastly, we do want to go deep in this area. This is foundational. This is foundational for, for evangelism. This is foundational for sanctification. We want to explore and study the sin nature. So I forget who asked the question. Maybe... Was it Danny? Someone asked the question about what does it mean that in sin I was brought forth and in sin my mother conceived me? Something like that. So let's go ahead. We're going to, these are the highlights, okay? So by the end of this, this, this uh, discussion, I hope to really, now we won't finish exploring the true confession because that's the whole chapter, but we should be moving clearly and understanding what this looks like, okay? So by the end, we'll come back and review these, uh, these points again. But uh, by the end of this discussion, I, I hope that we're in a better place. So if, if we are not, then I failed as a teacher. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's get into the text. Okay, so Psalm 51. Everyone can see that here. To the choir master, a psalm of David. When Nathan the prophet went to him, after he had gone to Bathsheba, have mercy on me, O God, according to your covenant love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in sin, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guilty guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased in burnt offering. The sacrifices of, a, of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good in Zion in your good pleasure. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. I feel like I should pray. <laughs> um, that is a prayer. I know, I'm saying like, you know, after we read the scripture, we, <laughs> we pray. So, uh, okay, let's come back up here and let me go back to my, my text here. Okay, I just want, I want to highlight some of the things that we had, we had looked at before. I'll just quickly read through these. I'll do first observations. Uh, there are many entreaties or requests to the Lord uh, to clean and remove sin. So there, it's just rep 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 repetitively asking for cleansing, asking for removing of the sin asking for restoring of the relationship, asking for mercy. This leads us to the point that David is really self-aware of sin. Uh, second point was the prayer begins with a request of for mercy. So the first thing that comes out of, of David's mouth at the beginning of the prayer is asking for mercy. Uh, number three, mercy is repeated twice in verse one. So not only is mercy the first point, it's re repeated. So it's very important. Verse number four, you have this courtroom setting where there's a judge, there's a law, and there's a judgment. That's, that's the, the setting, the image of the, the context, okay? Some questions that we have is, what is the time frame of the writing and the act? 
uh, in relationship to the act. Number two, the background, are these the exact words of David? Number three, why does David only say that he sinned against God when he sinned against others as well? Very good question. That was a question I've had, and I almost I was afraid to study it because, you know, it's like, why wouldn't he talk about sinning against other people? Okay, we're going to explore that. What does it mean, in sin my mother conceived me, verse 5, and then what is his son? Before we go into the text, the assignment was verses 1 to 5, more observations and also questions. So let me, what I'm going to do quickly here is, if you can prepare your, your assignment, I'm going to move this over so I'm not getting in the way. Okay, so what are, what are your questions or observations? Um, okay. Anyone have one? Go ahead and... Sorry. Go ahead. Who is that? I don't mean to start. Oh boy, go ahead. What do you have? Give it to me. Yeah. You have additional observation. Go ahead. Uh, number one is uh, in verse one and two. Okay. Uh, while David admitted his sin, he did not make a specific one or which one of those sins he committed. Oh, okay. That's really interesting. Okay. So he, he did not specify specify the sin okay or or which ones he committed right or yeah okay great what's your next comment or observation next is uh in verse three uh, David acknowledged that until God cleans him of his sins, it stays there, or the guilt stays. That's good. That's good. Excellent. So what you're saying is the sin and guilt remains. Can we say until God acts? Can we say that? Until yes. God acts. Yes, until God cleanses him of his sin, because that's what he's asking him. Yes. Cleans. Yeah. Great, great observation. What else do you have? Or is that it? Uh, another one. David also acknowledges that every sin committed is considered evil in God's sight. Very good. That's verses. Is that verse? Verses four. Verse 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 <laughs> you can't get okay. off that easy. Right? Okay, okay. I'll stop there. Great starting off. Oh, okay. Great, great job. Anyone else want to add? There's, there's more observations and questions here, but this is a good start here. Anyone else wants to add their, their comments or observations? Uh, we'll, we'll go. If they will not add. If they will not add what I have written here, and I will add this too. I still have two, but I will give them the chance. Okay. So let's go, let's go to, we'll go across the screen. So we'll go to Danny, then Ray, then, then Henry. So okay. Danny, go ahead. What okay. do you have? The answer for Bobo's question that I, uh, David did not uh, specify his, uh, uh, detailed his uh, sin because he said in verse 3, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always upon me. So, you know, alams na. The Lord knows his transgression. <laughs> That's why. That's <laughs> why. Huh? <laughs> he was just he was just shy to explicitly say it. Yeah, because <laughs> just like to me it's important. Something. It's related. If if apply it to us, do we also confess sins in the generic, not necessarily speaking or uh, specifying which sin did we commit when we when we confess? We'll just say, Sorry Lord, I commit the sin today. So which one? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's good. That's See? good. That's the point. That's the point. Yeah, no, no. That's the lawyer's. That's the lawyer's view. Yeah, it should now, be specific. Yeah. Now, now, he, yeah. Let's let's. Can we come back and talk? I do want to talk about that. I do. I do. Um, I agree with you that he does not specify the specific sin, and um, I do think that there were so many sins. So you think about there's lust, there's premeditation, there's murder. Adultery, there's murder, there's there's deceit. So there is a lot of sins. The other thing I would just want to push back on is that um, 
if David was saying like, I made a mistake, you know, then I could see him toning it down. But, but the words, I think we're going to see later when we study is the words used are very offensive. They're very strong. They're very strong words. And so I agree with you that he does not specify those specific sins, but the use of the word sin, the use of the word uh, transgression, transgression literally means rebel. So, I mean, it's very, it's very, it would be very shameful for us to use words like that. Whereas like for, so anyway, let's, let's talk about that. But, but Bull Boy's point is well taken and, and we should be confessing specific sins. Let, let's think about some, some answers there because we, we, we don't want to say, I do think that this is a good pattern for, for confession of sin, but let's think about that. But it's a, it's a great observation, Koya Bull Boy. I mean, really good. So Danny, go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay. Uh, I, I want to hear your uh, uh, explanation later. Why uh, David did not specify? Yeah, his... let, what I want to do is when we work through the text, I think you'll really see. You'll really see. Like, okay, this is actually very shameful, and and someone who someone who is saying these things, it's very humiliating what he's saying. So, I think that anyway, I'll save it. But. Great observation. Okay, Danny, do you have another observation for us? Or, okay, anyone else? Ray, Ray, Ray do you have an observation for us? Uh, it's still in verse 4. Uh, my observation is that as far as God's judgment to us, it's really justified. Okay, good. So, so verse 4, verse 4, God's judgment is, justifi is justified. That's a great, that's a great observation. That's a great observation. Henry, did you have an observation? Team, may I have uh, a question? Okay, sorry. Um, all right, Henry, just hold and then we'll get, we'll get Ray and then we'll come to you and then, so go ahead. What's, what's your question, Ray? What does, I, I don't know if it was covered before, but what does it mean by, why did, what did David mean when he was, brought forth in, in, in iniquity. Okay, yeah, so that is this question here. Number four. Number four. Okay, one and four, okay. So, yeah, so we're, gonna, we're going to explore that, Ray. We, that, that is, I'm gonna, we're gonna really go deep on that one. We're gonna really go deep because this is, a, this is actually a foundational passage for looking at the sin nature of mankind. Um, this is one of the foundational passages. Now, he's not teaching on, but, it, but it's the sin nature is presupposed. So we'll discuss that. Okay, uh, can we go on to Hen Henry now? Is that okay, Henry? Go ahead. Okay, it's in, in verse 5. It's in okay, verse, verse, five. verse 5. Here we go, verse okay. 5. It's verse 5. Uh, he is, uh, David is admitting that he is sinful. Hmm. Okay, he is Good. admitting that he is sinful. And not only from himself, he seen it was also it's like uh, through the generations it's like since the start of creation after after the fall it's the, after the fall sin was already there and the question is he justifying himself is he justifying himself observation justification uh, I'm a sinful. I'm a sinful person. So uh, maybe you can do a little, a little, a little, a little allowance. Allowance. So a little, a little long. I, I, I'm already a sinful. From birth, I'm already a sinful man. But give me a little. Don't punish me too harsh. Yeah, yeah. So let's do this though. Let's at least say that David does not suppose himself to be basically good with some sinful acts. Diba? Like that. So let's, yeah. let's make a clarification. David does not view himself as basically good with some sin. Rather, Sinful <laughs> by nature. The beginning. 
So something uh, somewhat that like he is justifying himself. Yeah, so is that is that the question you want to ask? Is he justifying himself? Is that the question? He's justifying himself, yes. So is he justifying himself that I'm a sinful person since the start? So maybe I will sin. But since I'm already a sinful person, I will sin. Is he blaming okay, God? Any other is question? Is he, is he blaming God? I, I would like to add steam to Henry's observation in verse 5. I have an additional one sentence observation in addition to what he said. Can we go back to Henry's observation in, number, in verse 5? Here it is. Here we go. Everyone see that? Yeah. Where's that? The David does not view himself as basically good with some sin, rather sinful from the beginning. My observation there is David unwittingly traces his birth as a product of sin. Okay, so verse five. It's, it's related to yeah, what Henry unwittingly, said. Unwittingly, yeah? the word unwittingly. Beginning. Yeah. It's like justifying himself. Because uh, even your uh, statement, David does not knew himself as basically good. So unwittingly, he said, I am a product of sin. That's why I am doing this. I, I did that sometimes. As, as you said, it is justifying. You're just another, another observation. Go ahead. My question is, 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 David, <laughs> is David, is David, is David, Telling that when he was conceived by her, by his parents, it was out of sin. Yeah. So the so the debate. That's the, the question. There's a question. There's a question. Yeah. Okay. There's so a question. Add this here. Okay. So there's a question. Uh, is, there's a question there. Number four. There's a question number four. What does it mean? So you're well, asking, I mean, is the conception it, the sin? It, it, yeah. In, in a specific sense, but like when two couples engage in premarital sex, that's really conception of, of sin. So yeah. would, would that really be on that in the reference? No. So, that, so that's the debate. Some people say, no, he's describing that the sin nature is transferred into him when there's conception. So every time there's conception, Adam's sin nature is transferred. And then others will say, no, 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 no. Uh, the act, even in marriage, is sinful. So that's why you have in the Catholic Church, the act of intercourse is always sinful. So the priests and the nuns never have intercourse. This is one of the texts they use. Oh my God. Yeah, because, because the, the, the flesh is inherently wicked. The spirit is inherently good. It's, it's dualism. It also comes from Platonic dualism. So that's why some of the saints, like back in ancient churches, yeah, yeah, go ahead. they gave their life to Christ and they were married, they would live without sex. Without sex. Yeah. They'd be husband. Yeah. I've read about that before. Yeah. And that's why the perpetual virginity of, of Mary. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's, let's go in next. Okay, so at least we set the table. Okay, I think we have... We've set the table. It's really good here. Okay, so let 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 us um, let's come back here. I do want to make I do want to make several observations here. Okay, we've already talked about this. Maybe we can we can highlight some things and uh, and move forward. The one thing when so uh, the one blessing for Bo for Boboy coming here is that some of the questions. I think Mac had a question too. Um, they really made me think, and I had to go back to look at the Hebrew. And then I was like, I should always be doing it. I should always be doing it. And now the last thing is I will be trying to always be uh, preparing my notes. It takes more time, but there's a lot more significant. And actually working through the Hebrew, I've really, I'm like, wow, this is powerful. So so I just want this to be, th some of this is lost. Like, let's just work through here, and I'll just highlight the first thing I want to highlight is uh, this idea of Nathan the prophet, okay? That's by design, all right? So especially in, in the original language, it's like emphasized. Which Nathan the prophet? And so here, to, to uh, this is literally 
Whenever you see the word prophet, think mouthpiece of God. You could even substitute a word of God or God speaking. So when Nathan goes to, to, to David, he's not going up. He, it's not like a pastor or someone. He's literally going in the place of God. Okay. So that's the first thing I want to highlight. Um, the other thing I want to highlight here is that the question that we have, the, the, what is the time frame, the writing and the, of the writing and the act? And also, are these the words of David, okay? So as I was studying here, this, this is not typical. Sometimes, sometimes it, the, 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 psalm, the psalmist will specify a setting or a context, but not always. You look at Psalm 1, Psalm 2, um, the, this is all of these, this here, this here, this here, this here. Those are all in the original. That's not added. It's not like a title added. It's, it's in the original. So, so in a lot of Psalms, if you read through the Psalms, it just says a Psalm of David, whatever it is, or a Psalm to whoever and whatever it is. So, so, so these, these facts, one, two, three, four, that's, that is really the setting and that's telling us a context. So, so if we're going to take a high view of God, of, of, of the Word of God, a high view of Psalms, now some people won't. Some people won't. Liberal scholars will not. But if we take a high view, this is telling us what is going on exactly. And when I look, when I looked at the, when I looked at the the, the Hebrew um, prepositions. This is accurate and this is accurate. Um, meaning to say that when and after is different descriptions of time, okay? So it's a Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him. So in, in we, if you remember us reading first, uh, second Samuel 11 and 12, David just says, I have sinned against the Lord. And then David continues. But, but here it's, further expanding upon what David said. So Bull Boy's question about when did David say this? When did he write it? He probably said it when Nathan, this is what, I mean, I shouldn't say probably. That's what the, that's what the, that's what the, that's what David is saying. Uh, the writer saying a Psalm of David when, <laughs> when the Nathan the prophet went to him. So David probably said it there and then he probably went back and wrote it out. Um, after he had gone into Bathsheba. So this is really giving us, this is really giving us context. Okay. This is really giving us context. So that, and number, number one, number two, are these the words of David? If we take a high view of scripture, yes, they're the words of David. We can say that emphatically. Okay. So those answer the question right off the bat. Okay. Um, and it's, it's, in, it's, it's, it's in the text. All right. Um, and then let's, let's go on here. Okay. Um, the next thing, we talked about last week, and I'll just highlight it again, is this idea of have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercies, blot out my transgression. Let me take a step back. Let us first go to, before we go and unpack this, let us first go back to Saul's prayer. I, I wanted to do that later, but let's go back and look at, let's look at what someone who is not, repentant, not contrite, not, um, not confessing their sin. Let's look at what someone is like. Let's go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 11 to 14. Saul had, Saul had multiple sins, failures, uh, and this is one of them. I'm going to begin in verse 8. Let me, let me bring this up here. Let me bring this up. But this would be an example of what a non-confession. This is a non-confession, okay? So this is Saul's unlawful sacrifice, according to ESV, okay? And he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Samuel went out to meet him to greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? <laughs> so what is Saul's response? Clearly did, disobeyed, did not follow the command, did not wait, 
went ahead and sacrificed. He was not supposed to sacrifice. This is, this is the priest's job, okay? So Samuel asked him, uh, this, is actually, uh, this is actually what we do when, when, when I'm working with men. You give them a chance to confess. <laughs> what have you done? So, so, I mean, this is very practical. Someone caught in a sin and, and you know that they've done something wrong. Don't, don't give, give them a chance to see if they'll confess. What have you done? <laughs> What's going on? What happened, right? So this is what, and Saul said, when I saw the people were scattering from me and that you did not come on the days of void. So the people were scattering. It's not my fault. You did not come. <laughs> you did not come on the days appointed. And the Philistines had mustered at Michmash. I said, now the Philistines will come against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself. <laughs> I had to do it. I forced myself and offered the, the burnt offering. Then Samuel said, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom will not continue. The Lord has sought a, out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over the people because you have not kept the, what the Lord commanded you. Now, if Saul had just confessed his sin, would this have been different? We look at David and it's like, yes, it would have been different. We know, we know with certainty the Lord was not looking for perfection. The Lord was looking for someone who is after his own heart, okay? So in, in, in Samuel, in, 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 this, in, in first and second Samuel, we always see these comparisons. We talked about this in the prayer of the prayer of Hannah, right? You had Hannah compared to Hanina. You had Samuel, the son of Hannah, compared with Eli's sons. You also have David compared with Saul, okay? You have these comparisons side by side. Both sin, even David's sin was greater but David was a man after God's own heart, okay? But coming back up here, I really want to highlight this. This here is the, the confrontation. Just like, just like uh, Nathan confronted, right? And David confesses his sin. When he's confronted, he confesses his sin. Saul says, Saul blames the people. This is blame one. Blame one, blame two. It's, it's so, Samuel, it's your fault. He blames the Philistines. And then here, he justifies. himself. Look at that. Blames three other people and he justifies himself. Think about that for a second. A any comments or questions? Or yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. It's like the Garden of Eden repeated. Remember <laughs> when uh, God confronted Eve? <laughs> it's the serpent. Yeah. <laughs> and when Adam was asked, it's the woman. So everybody was uh, pointing a finger at other persons because of that sin. So same thing here. It's just a repetition. Uh, I also make a comment observation thing because every time a person is confronted, there is always that question. Here, what have you done? At the Garden of Eden, what did God ask you? Where yes. are you? Say, where are you? Yes. So... Always, uh, that, always that question. Always that question. Now, uh, um, who else? Uh, Danny, did you want to say something? Uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, in the Garden of Eden, Adam blamed God for giving him a woman. Yeah. It's even worse. He blamed the woman and then he blamed God. I mean, really bad. Really bad. That's a great observation. Did someone else want to make a comment? Anyone else? But this is the thing. When you look at sin through the Old Testament, 
one of the purposes of the Old Testament is to show, it's to, Paul talks about this, that, that we, it's revealing the character of man, that, and, and then it talks about how the man just has all these sins, and you really see it. If you go back and look at all the other, a lot of different sins, it's the same. It's, it's like recapitulation over and over and over again, um, uh, which really shows you the depravity of, man, of, of, of man's heart, but it also shows you the David is a sinner, okay? But it shows you that the, the, the pure, it, the, David's confession is not like them, is what I'm trying to get at. The other thing I want to point out is that, is that this should be a pattern. This should be a pattern in our, in our uh, church discipline or in working with believers caught in sins. This is, this is a pattern. Um, you ask what has happened and then see, what, see their response. And if they're like, I, I messed up, you know, please forgive me. Like, especially someone caught in fornication or caught maybe stealing and see, see if there's excuses. If there's excuses, you know, there's no genuine heart change. You know that the man's heart is not after God's own heart. And so we don't cast them off, but you have to work with them to get them to a place where they can see their sin. Okay. So that's where biblical counseling comes in, meeting weekly and showing them and going deep, uh, looking at issues of the heart, not just symptoms. And, be, and praying that the Lord would really reveal that to them, okay? Let's, let's go on out. Let's go back now to... Question. I have, I have a question, Tim, before we proceed. Yeah, go ahead. Tim, uh, okay. Is there uh, someone in the Bible, Old or New Testament, who acknowledged his sin, mistake, without having to wait from God or somebody to tell him what he did or what he committed? Is there someone, is there someone in the Bible, Old or New Testament guy, yeah. Who immediately admitted his sin yeah. without waiting for someone to ask him, "What have you done? What did you do?" What? So, so you have you have uh, corporate prayers of confession by um, I'm going to mess this up. I always mix the two up. I think it's Nehemiah. I could be mistaken. Nehemiah, and then also from Daniel, where they're they're confessing the sins of the people without being told. Now that's corporate. That's corporately. That's not them specifically. But that would be an example where they're recognizing what they've done, how they've broken the law of God. To be honest with you, and this is what's so important. I'm pretty sure I could be mistaken. I don't really know of any example because even in a, I'm gonna mess the. I'm not good at names. It's either Joash or Josiah. They found the, the law. The law, mm -hmm. and then when they open up the book of the law, it's like, wow, we've been breaking. But it's, 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 it's the proclamation of the word and the spirit working through the proclamation of the word where they see their sin and they confess. And let me think about that, bull boy. I don't want to speak presumptuously, but I would think that there is not one exception where it's not the word of God, the spirit working through the word of God, exposing the sin. And then there's the confession. I, I, I really want to, that's a great, that's a great question, but, but I want to say that it's always the prophet. It's always the word of God that's exposing, that's exposing the truth. Um, even Peter was confronted by Paul in Galatians. And Paul spoke the word to him. It wasn't, it wasn't, it, it was the word of God. He spoke, spoke to him. There is power in the word. There is so much power in the word. Um, and when we go to all this other stuff, it doesn't work. Any other questions or comments? We'll, we'll, we'll move on now. Good. So what we have is we have a, we have a, a, a bad example of, of what confession looks like. So we, what we can clearly say in, in, with Saul is that he's clearly blaming other people and he's not taking responsibility. Okay? He's not looking inwardly. He's not looking inwardly. All right? And, and typically, that's how it is, even with, with the corporate prayers they're not listing specific sins. They're, they're just talking about we've transgressed. We're rebels. We, we're committing iniquity. We're, we're, we're breaking your law. Okay? So that's typical. And maybe that's part of the answer getting at why David doesn't give specific sins because that, that might be their pattern. Let's, let's go now to look at the text. So coming back here, we have this uh, verse 1. We talked about this already. So we have this this plea for mercy. And then what I want us to see here is we have this, this, so we have, we have this entreaty here, correct? We looked at this entreaty. This is a request. 
so have mercy on me. Contrast that with Saul. Bathsheba was beautiful. You don't understand. You don't understand, Nathan. Bathsheba was gorgeous. She's out there naked. She was the one out there naked. And I just, I couldn't, do you see? That's not what's happening here. Have mercy on me, oh God. Blot out my transgressions. We have here is a, this is, this is a, again, another entreaty. This is the verb. So we have a second entreaty here. Now, looking at this word, did anyone look up this word or, or try to discover meaning for this word? Did anyone have a chance to do that? Transgressions. Okay, that's fine. Another interpretation, another, another interpretation, it says iniquity. Okay, yeah, so, so there's iniquity. When I look up the word, the, the two possibilities are transgressions or rebellions. What I want us to see here is this is a big word. This is not a light word. This is um, someone called us in. I've been rebelling. <laughs> Do we speak like that? Do we talk like that to other people? I, I, I have been rebelling against God. Do we talk like that? I'm saying it's very strong. It's very strong. We would say I made a mistake. I'm struggling, right? So uh, contemporary usage, we're saying in the U.S., U.S. life. I don't know about Philippines. Philippines. It's a mistake. Could, uh, could it be Tim is talking to his guilt? No, guilt of that? rebellion. Yeah. Could it be that he was referring to his guilt? Guilty... Like guilt of his rebellion or his transgression. Yeah. So, are, maybe are you thinking about like the the degree of his sin? How how deep his sin is? Is is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So it's it's really getting at the, the level of sin. Okay. So he's not toning that. What I'm trying to say is he's not trying to minimize his sin. It's not a big deal, right? Uh, in our culture, U.S. culture, we would say mistake. We would say we would say mistake. We would say uh, struggle. I'm struggling. <laughs> or this other word is uh, I have a demon, <laughs> right? The uh, we could, we talk about like um, uh, it's almost like right. He, he he has his demons, right? It's like as if it's not from him. It's from <laughs> Satan, Diva. <laughs> Demon uh, possess. He's yeah, taking but, away the responsibility. Yes, he's removing the, yeah, it's, uh, I'm not saying literal, boy, boy, I'm saying figurative, like, he's removing the responsibility. He has his demons, right? Or something else, addiction. Just think about that word, addiction. Like when, like when, uh, when uh, what a thief goes to court and he will say, it's the demon that instructs me to do it, to kill the person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like a mental illness. Yeah. Not that those aren't legitimate. Especially but. when they are high on drugs, right, Kuya Buboy? The demon told me to kill him. Now, now, what I want to be clear here, okay? There are some people that have chemical imbalances, okay? And, and, and sometimes sin becomes so great, it becomes physiological or psychological. Do you see what I'm saying? People go so deep into sin, it now takes on, it goes deep into their psyche. It goes, it, uh, there's a physiological problem. Okay, so I am not denying the possibility that there could be a physiological problem or the sin is so great it becomes psychological, okay? Now there are, chemi you can have chemical imbalances which cause uh, um, psychological issues, okay? So I'm not, I am not attacking or discrediting those possibilities in statements. What I am saying though is that these here are ways in which people refuse to take accountability. They refuse to take responsibility for their actions. Now, maybe you know in the Philippine context what, what they use, okay? But what we can least agree upon is that they are not using <laughs> rebellions. <laughs> Someone who is calling themselves in, in, a, in a humble way or like in a very contrite way, I'm, I'm rebelling against God. 
that is not someone who's making an excuse. That is someone who is acknowledging their problem. I mean, to, to call yourself a rebel is very humiliating. If, if, if yes. Not to the NPAs. Huh? Not to the NPAs. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. But, <laughs> NPA, yeah. they're proud to be rebels. Yeah. Re re rebels against God, though. Rebels against, and, and no doubt some in America would do the same. They would take, but someone who, who is a spiritual person would not be saying this unless they're contrite. They're contrite. It, I think it's because rebellion is usually addressed as a political I crime, not an um, institutional or religious crime, unless you are reading the Bible. Yeah. Uh, ordinary people would look at rebellion as a crime against the government, against the state. Yeah, so this would be uh, uh, in religious context. So I would imagine, Bull Boy, they would never say they're rebels against God, Iba. No one would say that. That would be very offensive here, Iba. So in the context of religious, in the context of the Catholic Church, no one would say that they're rebels against God. So if you, are you a rebel against No, they would not say it. So what I'm trying to say, though, is that, yes, fair enough, that, that now it has a political meaning, um, fair enough. But, but in a religious context, people are not using this terminology. Okay. And I'm not saying that when someone confesses their sin, they should use this. What I'm trying to say is that David really saw himself for who he, for what he was, a rebel against God. Very humbling, very humbling. And contrast that with Saul. Again, the contrast is Saul. Saul does not say, I have rebelled against the commandment of God. Saul, I beg mercy, plead for my case. Nothing. Ask the Lord to have mercy. No, it's like, he did it, he did it, he did it. I just, I was forced, I was compelled. Okay, let, let, let's, we're, uh, what, one other thing I want to bring out here, okay? Now, um, I don't, I don't want to stress you to require you to do this. With, sorry, I, I do want to go to one other, um, in looking at this, looking at this word here, okay? I want to, I want to look at one other thing. Um, I'm trying to really study what this word signifies, okay? So uh, transgressions, iniquity, rebellions. Um, one helpful tool is going to the, uh, the LXX. Has anyone heard of the LXX or we could say Septuagint? Does everyone know what the Septuagint is? Everyone knows it's, um, it's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, okay? So this is, this is Greek translation of OT, okay? All right. The benefit of going to the Greek translation is that you actually, it's like a commentary. So you say, well, what did, what did they mean? It's not inspired, but, it, it, but it's very helpful to say, okay, so when they translated, what was that word? What did it convey, okay? What, how did they understand this word, okay? In the Septuagint, the word is lawless. Lawlessness. Blot out my lawlessness. That's very offensive. If someone says I'm I'm lawless, I'm that lawbreaker. People will not oh boy. Will people say I'm a lawbreaker? <laughs> it's, it's easy to understand. Yes. It's easy. It's easier to understand if you say that lawless, lawlessness, lawbreaker. It's, it's because offensive. everybody, everybody's aware. I am a law-abiding citizen. Exactly. So it's offensive if you were to say I'm a law. I'm breaking God's law. It's offensive. It's very. People will yeah. not speak like that. So what I want us to see though is that is that looking, comparing this word and this word, we can really understand perhaps lawlessness better than rebellions. Okay, and so here David is really this 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 statement here is really showing David's humility and honesty. We see that blot out my lawlessness. Then what he says here is again another entreaty. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the 
to me, the context of blood out by transgression, it connotes that your transgressions, your lawlessness, had been recorded somewhere. Yes. Like yes. you have been in, in the context, you have been charged in court. So there is a, there is a record of what you did. There's a record of your crime. So in here, where do you get the record of the crime or of what you committed? Uh, lo the lawlessness you committed. I forgot to add that. That is a great point, and you're dead. You're deadly accurate. You're you're deadly accurate there. The blot out is. I don't want to misspeak, but I'm pretty sure it's in the context of the warning in Deuteronomy to uh, blot out name in book of the covenant. There's also warnings in uh, there's also warnings in uh, Revelation, Book of Life, and then in Revelation twenty, in the in the final judgment, books are opened. And it's the book of life, it's the book of life that we are saved from by, okay? Everyone see that there? So, Kuya Danny, I have a Kuya Bobo, excellent observation. And that's really this full meaning here. Thank you for reminding me. Great observation. Um, so it's really, and, and another word we could use here is wipe out. Wipe out. There's this guilty verdict in God's law, in the judgment, and so the punishment must come. And so he's asking, wipe out, wipe it out so that I will not receive the punishment, which would be death. What, what David did, death times two, capital punish, capital murder, and also adultery. Okay. Great, great observation. Let's move on here because I do, we're getting, it's becoming late and we do, we need, we need to get to the bread and butter where we're going to go. So, um, let me just move quickly here. Um, uh, wash me thoroughly. This is uh, this could be manner. Um, repetitively. Now, now here, now here we have a. This is um, This is a. This is a. Um, a court room uh, setting diba. So this is a courtroom setting, okay? What about here? What is the setting here? So we have this blot out my transgressions, blot out my lawlessness, courtroom setting. What about verse number two? What's the setting here? The setting. What 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 context does it make you think about? What's the image? What's the imagery? In the in the courtroom setting, it's like you dismiss, you quash my information, you quash the information against me, you quash the charges against me, you dismiss the case against me. That's the equivalent. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's so that Thomas, Thomas. So that's so that's here. But now, verse two a, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. What's what's the image here? It's not a courtroom setting. What's the image of wash me thoroughly from my iniquity? Bath in the in the bathroom. <laughs> Meaning, like you know, no. taking a bath. Yes. It's, uh, it's uh, So this is another entreaty. So this is a. Uh, so this is the. This is this is one. I think the context. The context is just like when your name is blotted out. You have a clean slate. Yeah. You are new. You have. You have no. There are no more charges against you existing in the records. There are no more uh, crimes against you as far as the record is concerned. That's yeah. how it's washed and that's how it's cleansed. Because yeah, you are no. now blot out. It is blot out. Erased. Wiped out. No more. Yeah, so this is laundry context, uh, cleaning, cleaning. We could say in the Old Testament, they would wash everything. They'd wash pots and pans because it was unclean to clean. They would wash their bodies. They would wash their clothes. So this is laundry. This is like a, this is like a cleaning, cleaning, uh, bathing context, okay? All right? So now... Yeah, that's it. 
the, the mention with the hisop, it's like in the cleaning, right? Yes, and, and we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Okay, that great, great. Later on, we're going to see that as well. Um, and, and we notice here, we notice here that it's uh, that it's this again, this iniquity. Okay, and uh, so this is this is like sin, and then you have this repetitively. And wash me thoroughly implies he's very dirty. It's very dirty. Okay, this implies. Um, very dirty. So, so he's not just saying, uh, you know, clean me. It's like, really clean me because I'm so dirty. That's the sense that's being conveyed. I think it's it, the, literally in the Hebrew, it's many. It's many. <laughs> uh, much dirt. Many, uh, uh, wash me thoroughly. Rock because, me. Yeah, because in the Old Testament, they use the word, you're unclean. You're yeah. unclean. And then here, the, the last... The last one we have here is this yet another cleanse me. Now this is this is uh, in this is uh, in a in a purify and this is like uh, this word used here is like a sin sin offering. It's the same word being used. So I'm not saying it's a sin offering, but what I'm saying is this is in the context of of uh, religious, religious cleansing, religious cleansing. Okay. So this is now uh, religious. Th there's three different Hebrew words used here for sin. There's three different. One, two, three. So we we're only into verse two. There's four requests. In, in verse 2, I think the setting here is in a temple setting. Uh, yeah, so for sure, cleanse me for my sin would be a temple. It's a religious context, a, a, a temple setting, because you would, you would have things purified, especially with the sin offering. So for sure, this, was, this would be temple here. So verse 1 is a court setting. Yeah, court setting, and then you have like this cleansing set, setting where they're cl cleaning things. They would take a bath. You know, he's asking to be cleansed. So whether in his mind he's like a shirt that needs to be cleansed that's dirty, or he's asking for his body to be clean, or we don't, there isn't, it isn't specified. What's specified is the dirtiness and also that he needs to be clean. And then this is a temple or the tabernacle because. The, the, the temple has not yet been built. It's built by Solomon. So it's, it would be, but I mean, the, it's where the worship takes place. So it's the tabernacle and then it becomes the, uh, it becomes the temple. Okay. So great observation, Henry. But so what I want us to see here, we have, David is looking at, there's three, there, uh, there's multiple realms that he needs to be cleansed. I mean, this is, this is someone that brings us right into verse three. It's like, boom, right there. Watch this. Why? Cause. Reason. I. What does he know? This is a knowing statement. I know object. I know my transgressions. My sin is ever in my presence. Think about that. Think about that. Why is he begging all these things to happen? Why? Because, because of guilt, probably. Yeah. It's always reminding him or torturing him inside their heart, his heart. Self you know, awakening. Thank you.
He is self-aware of his sin. Incredibly self-aware. You would not talk like this if you're trying to hide. I counted in this statement in verses in verses uh, two, in verse uh, verse one and two and three. There's over five references, and there's three different kinds of sins. There's there's three different contexts. There's five different explicit mentions. So you talk about repeating words. He repeats sin five times. And there's different ways he describes it. Rebellions, lawlessness, sin, sin in a religious context. So this is not someone who is trying to hide. This is not someone who is trying to, to uh, make excuses. I mean, he, his folk, so his focus here is becoming right again with God. And understanding understanding that this relationship has been broken by his sin. You see that? Everyone see that? Now here, this, this comes down. This gets even deeper, okay? Against you, this, we're going to get to one of our questions we're going to answer. Against you, I have sinned. So the actor is, is David. And so um, I'm just going to rewrite this. The, the, I mean, really the object, who has he sinned against? The object is God. Iba. Now, here's the question. What, the issue we're wrestling with is, um, um, let's, finish, let's finish diagramming the se second part because there's a, a, and then we can come back here, okay? So this is a progression here. And then we have, we have done evil. Number, so now we had five references. Now we're at seven and there's four different kinds. He's a rebel or a lawless person. He sins, uh, different word for sin in religious context. Then those two words are mentioned again. And then you have again, I've sinned. And then I have done evil in your sight. So there's seven references in two and a half verses to sin. This is someone who is incredibly aware of what he has done and is broken, object. And then this is the location. This is with, ref you could say reference. I have done what is evil in your sight. Or we could say, I mean, this could be maybe, I don't want to say location, with reference. Who is looking? Who's the one looking? It's God. Uh, so. before, we, before we go, may just I, before I forget, uh, when, when David said that against you only and you only have sinned, uh, to me, there's something to do with this relationship with God. That uh, Unless there's something in between us, our relationship is still there. Yeah. But since I did something that offends you, and you consider it not as unredacted, but as evil, then my relationship with you is in jeopardy. So I have to address this to you. Yeah. That's, that's, that's how I see it. Why, why you only? Why you only? Yeah. No, so that's good. So let's, let's, let's do this. Can we, can we finish this verse and then we'll continue next week, okay? Let, let's, let's go deep here, okay? So I do want to, what, boy, boy, I think you're really going in the right direction. Uh, um, let's, let's, let's look at some passages of scripture and let's really go deep. And that was actually, I forgot to write in our things. I, I did want us to get to, to this question. So let me just first finish the, the verse and then we'll discuss that. So what we want to see here is we have this uh, purpose. Purpose one, purpose two. And really, these are, these are like, uh, again, like a progression or like a restatement. But look at this. Look at this. Who is the one who is to be justified? Who is the object? The object of this justify is not, do you see this? That you may be justified. So 
God here is not the actor, but he is the one receiving the justification. Do you see that? That you may be justified. So the question is, why is he saying, why is he saying that he hopes the Lord will be justified? Because the, yeah, because the Lord brought the accusation, Diba. The Lord brought the accusation that you have sinned. You are the man, Diba. And so if, if David does not accept responsibility, what he is saying is, Lord, you are not speaking the truth. I am, so this is something for us to think about. When we justify ourselves and refuse to accept our blame, we are actually, uh, Say, God, you're not right. I am right. Think about that. So what David is saying is, is that I need to confess this sin so that you will be justified in your claim. You will be blameless in your judgment because it's the truth. So powerful. So powerful. So when we, when we do not confess our sin, and, it's, and it's, um, uh, we are in essence not letting God be justified. He, he, of course, he is justified, but, it, but in, in, in another sense, we're not. We're, we're justifying ourselves and claiming that God is not true. So Roman says, let, let God be true and every man a liar. <laughs> so so um, this is something to think about. When we do not confess our sins, David's purpose, remember, what is the purpose? Why is David emphasizing? So that you may be, David wants God to be shown vindicated, that you will be blameless in your judgment. Because if David does not vindicate God, people could blame God. People could blame the prophet. And we saw, we see this later in, 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 in uh, they kill the prophets. <laughs> <laughs> kill them <laughs> because they don't like the word that they've said um let's go quickly here let's look at several the the thing i want us to think about here is this okay so this is where we're going here okay so what i want to look here is at this um there's god right he's the judge then there's a law correct and then there's a verdict Guilty, not guilty. You Bob boy? So this gets to the point where Bull Boy is talking about. The focus is on, the focus is on, for David, the focus, David, David's focus is on God, his relationship. Now, why is that? Why is that? Because the, the, the violation is against uh, God and his law. Do you see that? The violation is fundamentally against God and his law. So then the question is, would David have sinned against Uriah if there was no law? Could David have killed Uriah if there was no law? Yes. <laughs> the law is what, the, um, without any law, anything is possible. There has to be a standard by which then we can be judged. Diba? No standard. So, for example, your children. If you do not give a standard to your children, you cannot punish them. Diba? <laughs> Diba? If there's no law, there's no transgression. There's no transgression. Exactly. So, let's go to some Bible verses to really prove this. This will make so much more sense. We all, this will make so much sense. So let's go first to, let's go to Romans chapter 5. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, let's begin in verse, verse 6. I'm sorry, not verse 6. Verse, verse 12. Verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through man and death through sin, so death was spread to all men because all sinned. Now, there's debate on that translation. It's really... We're going to come back here and discuss because all sin, but just ignore that for a minute. Um, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. <laughs> so that's a fact. 
So putting aside the difficulty that Paul, I don't want to, I don't want to discuss because there is debate, there is discussion as far as what does Paul mean there. But what the the fact is is what Paul says here. Forget the bigger debate. Uh, in in part, this, what I want to focus upon here is this this statement here. Paul is addressing how it could be that people sinned before the law. Okay, so. That's a separate issue. What I want to see here is the statement, though. Sin is not counted where there is no law. So that is a universal truth. This is a universal truth. If there is no law, there is no sin. Let's go to one of the passages, Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. What shall we say then? That the law is sin by no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law did not say, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. Again, debated points. I don't want to discuss that. The main point is that if there is no law, you cannot punish. So everyone tracking with me there? So coming back to this comment here against you and you only I have sinned it's because it's God's law at the end of the day all the violations when you talk about crimes the crime is against the Philippine government and the Philippine government that's criminal law right and then you can have civil law where there's crimes against each other Diva. but in criminal law it's, it's it's the crime against the state Oh, but correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to misspeak, but is that is that correct? Yeah, correct, correct, correct. That's why it's called People of the Philippines versus Tim Spears. <laughs> there you have it. There you have it. It's not Tim against the neighbor. If I, if I killed my neighbor, it's not me against, it's, I've broken the law. It's Tim against the Philippines, U.S. Tim against the people of whatever it is, okay? So that, that is why Paul, uh, uh, David says against you. Because it's God's law. It's God's law. <clears throat> so, it, of course, he has, his sin has impacted and hurt. And that needs to be reconciled. What he's done to Bathsheba, what he's done to, um, uh, what he's done to, to Uriah. But at the end of the day, it's God against David. <laughs> so, so this is so important, especially in the U.S. and now with like different sins. Diba, homo, homo, you can't say homosexuality is a sin. Diba, the, the temptation is always to put Tim against the person who is committing the sin. I, and I want to say, no, 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 no. I am just sharing with you the law of God. This is not my law. No, no, it's you against God, not me. You against God, okay? And so, uh, so when it comes to sharing the gospel, when it comes to sharing sin, we always want to remove ourselves out of the picture and say, no, 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 no. You are violating God's law. Your sin is against God's law. Now, that does not mean that we should not apologize, but fundamentally, when someone sins, they are breaking the law of God, okay? Th I will say one other thing on this point. Um, this is also apologetic. So this is why the, the, the moral argument is a proof for the existence of God. If God does not exist, there is no eternal standard. And the, the Philippine government, the U.S. government could say abortion is legal. And now it's morally good. The, the, the government of Germany said Jews should be killed. That became moral. So, so the, if someone says, no, no, you cannot kill because that's a crime against humanity, you're appealing to the law of God, my brother. <laughs> Convert, become a, become a theist. If you're denying universal, if you acknowledge there's universal truths, any universal truths, sanctity of life, whatever it is, you're appealing to the law of God, and we win the debate. Convert, become a Christian. So, 
Uh, we did not finish where I wanted to go to tonight. I apologize for going long. Um, so just really coming back here to the highlights, uh, I forgot to add discussing this law component. So I failed in <laughs> exploring this in nature, but I was successful. I added a different point. So um, let's continue next week. And um, uh, I do want to emphasize answering Bull Boy's question. I think that for, for Jews, um, when, when they were showing... I'll do more research here, but I think with, with like sharing specific sins, um, the focus is really on if they said, I've sinned against God, I've rebelled against God. In a, in a Hebrew context, that was really the ultimate, that was very humbling. That's why like Pharisees, they, they're, they're holy. They don't sin. <laughs> I, thank, I thank you, God, that I am not like this public in here. I do this, 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 this. Pharisees will never say I sin. We are, we, Paul's sarcasm. We are not Gentile sinners. <laughs> We're Jews, not Gentile sinners. Galatians 2. To, to call, to call a, a Jew a sinner or a, a Gentile, very offensive. Okay, so when, 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 David, when David is calling himself a sinner, a, a rebel, a transgressor, a lawless person, that is incredibly, you will never hear that coming from a Pharisee, ever, ever, ever. So um, that, that, the other thing I want to say, Bo Boy, is that when we were studying the prayers, even the prayer of Jesus, the prayer is not comprehensive. Okay, so our study, Bo Boy, we looked at the prayer, uh, the Lord's Prayer, we looked at the prayer of boldness, we looked at Hannah's prayer, and then we're, we're looking now at the prayer of confession, okay? There's many prayers of confession in the Psalms, there's prayers of confession in Chronicles and Samuel, also in um, Nehemiah and Daniel. And so uh, in various prayers, they actually go into details. So my answer for not having specific is that this is not comprehensive. Um, and so we definitely still should, should confess our sins. I do think, I think what we're saying here is that David is so focused on that relationship and his sin is so much in his mind. And the focus is restoring that relationship. He is so self-aware that he is on the verge of being uh, eternally separated from God. He is on that verge there. And, and he is just focused on wanting to restore the relationship. And he's broken. We'll see later that he says, I, you know, a broken and contrite spirit. My sin is ever, I mean, he is someone who is, is, has the weight of sin on his, on his body. And I mean, looking at the courtroom context, the, the bathroom context, the, the temple context, I mean, he is just, whatever context, I'm a sinner, just, just make it right. Um, let, let's just, I'll open this up. Anyone wants to share, to discuss, interact? Tim, just a thought earlier when you, the one when you discussed the Romans verse. So in that case of Adam and Eve, there was no law then, diba? Right? There was no, there was no uh, law as far as, the old covenant, but there was a law. Uh, so he was not referring to the Ten Commandments, he was referring to that. Yeah. So so he'll even in, in Romans, he's he's arguing that 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 God's in Romans too, he argues that God's law, the the, the, the Jews have God's law written. Gentiles who don't have the written law have it written on their hearts. So Paul's argument is is really expanding an understanding of God's mor uh, moral law beyond the old covenant. So both in justification of Abraham. So yeah, so the answer is yes. And when you look at the theology, especially in um, um, other parts of scripture, and also in Romans, is that um, there was an Edenic covenant. God made a covenant with Adam, okay? And so if you, if you imply it, uh, a covenant, there's always a law. And so mm. what was the law uh, in the Edenic covenant? Do not eat of the tree of the Don't knowledge. Don't eat destruction, right? Yeah. Um, Don't eat of the tree. The day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good evil, you will die. So that's the commandment. That that's the that's the stipulations of the Adamic covenant. So I do think that's really important. Uh, just to say, Ray, that we have a covenantal framework. That's how God interacts. So from the beginning of time, God interacts with man through covenant, and within the covenant, there is this this component of the covenant is law. 
So you have Adamic covenant, Noahic covenant, Abrahamic covenant. That's reconfirmed with Jacob, with, uh, with uh, Isaac, Jacob, and then the old covenant, Davidic covenant, and then finally the new covenant. So, um, and then we can look at those covenants under covenant of works versus covenant of grace. Any other great, great, great question, great option, great, great question. Any other questions or comments? Okay, it's it's nine fourteen. It's late. Um, uh, great job! Thank you so much for your observations. I think we're slowly getting in this habit of of doing questions and observations. Observations can be anything. They can be an action. They can be a description. They can be repetitive words. They can be going deeper into a word. So just keep what you're doing. Let's let's continue for next week. And um, we do. I do want to maybe pick it up a little bit. We did go kind of deep here, but I think it's really good. We're really setting the table um, and going deep in this prayer profession. Any other comments or, or questions? Danny, can, can you close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, lesson tonight. Thank you for using team to teach us. Lord, we pray that uh, we may be able to apply this uh, learning in our lives and be able to also teach others uh, this lesson that uh, we will have a, a greater understanding of the word that we are able to really dig deeper into your word so that uh, our spirit will be lifted up and we are able to have a, a big picture as well as the details of uh, how you want to uh, tell us your story and your, how you want to deliver your message to us through your word. Just let me pray. Amen.